You can listen to The Professional Left on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for October 26th, 2018. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the Cornfield Resistance, where our caravan is always full of Middle Westerners, and they're usually giggling, it's the professional left with Drift Glass and Blue Gal. That is true. We have a, it's not a Dodge caravan, it's a no. minivan though, and it is full of Midwesterners who are giggling. Most Often of singing... The Bohemian Rhapsody at Bohemian one in the morning. Bohemian Rhapsody at the top of their lungs. While driving yes. across. That's sort of our family anthem at this point, really. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, you know, I never, believe me, a decade ago, if you told me that I'd be booming across the Midwest in a minivan with a car full of kids singing Bohemian Rhapsody at one in the morning, I would have said, uh, no, you're <laughs> wrong. That is not possible. And yet, here I am. That was That was the night that their flight from visiting their dad got in really late. Yes. And uh, we drove back to Springfield from St. Louis. It was only a 90 minute drive. But no. when Bohemian Rhapsody comes on it's at one thirty in the morning, you crank it. Everybody wake up. Everybody up. <laughs> oh, my God. Sing Bohemian Rhapsody. God, I don't want to do it. Get up. Uh-huh. Yeah. It's like the great Santini, except, you know, a lot more laughs, actually. <laughs> a lot more laughs. <laughs> a lot and a lot less militarism. Yes. <laughs> Uh, we have a new customer for Hello Fascist this week. We do? Yeah, I didn't include it on our notes, but I'd like to mention it just really briefly. Sure. Uh, it's uh, Jerry Rivers, also known as Geraldo Rivera. Uh, yeah. Who, uh, who tweeted uh, just literally moments ago. This is, we're recording this on a Friday. Uh, Never mind, outsmarted myself in conjuring false flag operation designed to hurt real Donald Trump, the GOP. Actually, alleged perp is a 56-year-old, is apparently a stereotype most media assume. Middle-aged, rabid, extreme right-winger with a troubled past and a long criminal record. In other words, he's your fucking target demographic, isn't he there, Jerry? Right. Um, yeah, so Geraldo's going to have to be eating in for a couple of months. So I'm <laughs> suggesting that he look up the good people at Hello Fascist because, Jerry, people are really, really going to be peeing in your food a lot. I mean a lot from now on. So check into that. Well, and Candace Owens, who yeah. I blocked this week on Twitter, also yes. said, 100% false flag operation. This oh. is 100% guaranteed. This is not a right winger. This is Democrats interfering with the election. Yeah. And then she deleted her tweet. So uh, I would say that Geraldo did the braver thing yeah. to admit he was wrong and that he conjured something. That's an admission of, mm-hmm. you know, this is what I do for a living. I conjured some bullshit. To deflect yeah. onto liberals, which is what I do for a living. Oopsie doopsie. Well, you'll forgive me, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch I, of people that who get yeah, forgiven. Yeah, my, my no direct deposit do. from Fox still goes through. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, Can, uh, Dave Atkins, I believe, caught uh, took a screenshot of Candace Owens. Um, you know. I oh think yeah, the screenshot will last forever. Absolutely. I think she should change yeah. her name to P W N E S because she's been pwned <laughs> by herself, of course. But uh, but he wanted to know he. he he thought she should be held responsible. I think that's a reasonable request. But my my question to him was, by who? Who's going to hold her responsible? She doesn't yeah. answer to anybody who is responsible. She answers to a, a despicable, evil media corporation that's that pukes hatred out and loves people like her. So you know, the the worst case scenario is she ends up on the on the uh, Mark Halpern bench for thirty days. And then the Gingrich rules kick in and she's back on, you know, back doing her thing. Right. And, and everyone just forgets that this ever happened because that's what we do now. We just forget these things happen because they're really inconvenient. Yeah. You think that people are going to forget Megan Kelly and then anything she ever said? Because her show is now officially canceled as of oh, two hours yeah. ago. Yeah. Uh, it'll just be one of those oopsie doopsie. Um, there there was a uh, uh, an article in Dame Magazine. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure I get back to that. I did not include it in notes again, but Dame Magazine from, I think, July or August of this year. And it was a breakdown of all of the reporters and all the TV shows and all the people you could hire uh, just with the money that um, media corporations have paid out to yeah. like Matt Lauer. Right. Matt Lauer, Matt, just the money for Matt Lauer alone could have paid for, if I remember correctly, 500 TV journalists. Mm-hmm. 
Yep. Uh, if you think yep. journalism is dying for lack of money, it's not. All the money is going to scumbags at the top like that or to payouts to them because they're perverts. I'm really glad that they had to set fire to a bundle of money when Roger Ailes got kicked out of Fox. I mean, that sort of takes the, the edge off. But MSNBC, which is always crying poor mouth about everything um, and hires just the worst people from Fox News and plugs them in where nobody wants them and then acts shocked when nobody shows up to the party. Uh, is going to have set fire to I don't know how many tens of millions of dollars at the end of the day. And will they be held responsible? No, they're a private corporation. The people at the top are never held responsible for what they do. They'll just find some other person to plug into that spot. It'll just be one of those, whoops. And I think a year from now, uh, maybe someone will take it in the teeth for this monumentally stupid decision. But having worked in corporations and worked in government and worked in education and a whole bunch of places, uh, one thing I have learned to be true is that when you have a weak administration, a weak um, uh, management structure, the people at the top never take responsibility for the horrendously stupid decisions that they make that everyone knows is their fault. Right. You can't lose face. You can't raise your hand and say, I fucked up. I made a terrible mistake. That was really dumb because that's a show of strength. Yeah, yeah. That's a show of acknowledgement that you really did mess up. That never happens. Uh, at the top of, of heaps like this. So maybe six months from now or a year from now, there'll be a management shuffle and someone will look at someone sideways and they'll, they'll end up doing, you know, a special projects, which will be them looking out the window for the next two years. But nothing fundamental will change because the business model for these corporations is um, doing what they're doing now. Yeah. yeah. Which leads us to uh, the topic for this week's episode. <laughs> don't mind. No, I don't uh, mind. I have decided to, to, to pick the bull up by the horns this week and change, completely change our focus, Blue Gal. Uh, this is the day, by the way, this is Friday, October 26th. Uh, literally hours ago, the FBI caught the uh, MAGA bomber. He is uh, neither a monster nor an alien. He is the Fox News core demographic. Um, so that's sort of the, the moment in time when we're recording this. But I want to shift focus completely and do a really deep dive into the underappreciated season one of Babylon 5. Yeah, okay. <laughs> now. And you told me to bear with you. You warned me. You said, I'm going to do this, and I just want you to bear with me. Okay. Now, well, it's very important that you, that you bear with me because, um, first of all, a lot of people think the first season of Babylon 5 sucked. And you know why? Because it did. It was terrible. <laughs> it was just wooden, and it was all plot set up, and and, uh, and not until – John Sheridan showed up in the second season, really. The the, the back half, the back few episodes of the first season. Um, Is this going to be that, inspirational to people who've had a really long week with Donald Trump and feel like they're losing their country? It's going to be a handoff to my wife. Okay, and then I'm going to do that. All right. Needs to trust I, that's um, coming, folks. I want you to know we're going to give you It's hope. coming. Yeah. So my question for you is, do you know when season one of Babylon 5 um, premiered? I really have no idea anything about Babylon 5 at all. It premiered October of 1994. Do you know what also happened in October of 1994, darling? Uh, no. The Republican Party was gearing up to take over the House of Representatives That's under true. a guy named Oh, Newton, this is a dovetail, isn't Gingrich. it? See? You trust, you tr got to trust drift class, blue gal. Yeah. yeah, Newton Leroy Gingrich was gearing up to take over the House of Representatives in 1994. A few years later, Newt Gingrich would be driven from power due to scandal and overreach and adultery and corruption and lying and being a racist bomb throwing scumbag and generally being a toxic waste dump of human filth and no one wanted to touch. Newt Gingrich then uh, has not held public office since, by the way, mm -hmm. in, in the quarter century, more or less since then, he has not held public office at all. And in all that time, he has never been out of the media spotlight for more than a couple of months at a That's time. That's right. The entire Beltway media devoted itself entirely to not just salvaging Newt Gingrich's career and propping him up and reselling him to the public as a as a wise and thoughtful and and quick witted and clever, um, uh, great eminence, you know, a, 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 a senior leader, um, an elder statesman, if you will, of the Republican Party. But they did it over and over and over and over and over again because every couple of months Newt Gingrich would go on to meet the press. No, I'm sorry, he would go somewhere in public, like with the um, Oh, the Ground Zero Mosque. Mm -hmm. And he'd take a giant racist shit in public. And then David Gregory would have to be rushed to the scene to put Newt Gingrich on TV in order to not ask him any questions about the Ground Zero Mosque at all. Right. And the, the goal was to 
refurbish Newt Gingrich's career, take off the edges, remind everybody, just let's forget about what just happened. I let's disagree. Forget about- I disagree. I don't oh, think see, that's, is- I don't think that refurbishing Newt Gingrich's career is at all what anyone on cable news is interested in. They are interested- see now we have a conversation. <laughs> they are interested in filling the space between pharmaceutical commercials as yes. cheaply as possible. That's why Rick Santorum is on TV. It mm-hmm. is a former Republican office holder, so they can be both sides about it. Uh-huh. It is someone who will speak in in sound bites uh, in the least uh, jarring way possible to the TV medium. He will mm-hmm. be in the in your car that you send over to his house to get him to bring him to the studio, sure. and he will sure. be in the makeup chair behaving himself. Uh, on time and ready to go with a comment about today's, whatever today's news is. And as I've said many times on, I don't remember if when I've said it on the podcast, but I say it all the time over at Crooks and Liars. Newt Gingrich plays Mad Libs. He fills in the blank of whatever the breaking news is this morning, who got killed, who got bombed, what Mm -hmm. war zone face some sort of humanitarian disaster he fills in the blank with that breaking news and then says democrats are to blame for this obama is to blame for this and it is and when you see it when you google newt gingrich blames and start scrolling through under google news all of these headlines newt gingrich blames democrats liberals obama democrats in congress whatever for the current news disaster that's going on Mm -hmm. he's timely He's on time to show up for the studio and he mm-hmm. speaks in a way that gets them to commercial on time. And, and it does says, not matter if he is the worst person in the world. Mm-hmm. If he wears a suit, is in the makeup chair on time and says things in a timely way that gets them to the commercial on time, producers and bookers love him. Well, and, and he, he ends every paragraph with, there's no question. There's yeah, no question. Yeah. There's yeah. No question. Now, uh, just just to uh, carry along that that line, because I have a, a little bit of a disagreement with you, but not one that will break up our marriage. I promise. <laughs> that will um, never happen. <laughs> no, no. Um, uh, By Susan the way, Smith. middle child often try. She is now at this sixteen year old stage of saying things to shock parents, yes. and it's best to just that. stay in your seat and and uh-huh. no, you know, I don't even inhale anymore when she says, mm-hmm. "Hi, mom, we're going out to do drugs." You know, it's yeah. it's whatever it is. Remember but, to bring out enough for everybody. Yeah, yeah <laughs> right. It's good to hate your parents. Have a good day. You know, just mm-hmm. relax, right? But she does often say, you know, you could just divorce him. Right. Right. <laughs> and, and she knows. I don't even look up from my laptop at that. Like, yeah, have a nice time. Go see you later. Yeah. You know, you know, I'd take that little car, right? Oh, yeah. that's right. Oh. <laughs> oh didn't, didn't th- the little car that she's driving around goes with him in the divorce. Much you know that, right? The time now. <laughs> Pretty much 90% of the time she's behind the wheel of that car. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, I do want to point out that that New Gingrich, um, not, this is not the first time in his career at all, but this was back in the 90s. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Susan Smith case, a woman who murdered her children. Yes, right. Um, he yeah. said... Uh, we are in, in, I'm quoting now, we're in very deep need change if we're going to turn this country around. Um, there's no question. There's no question. He, he kept saying over and over again that um, this was, these were the Democrats. This is what happens mm-hmm. when you put Democrats in charge. The only way you get change, he said, I think the that the mother killing the two children in South Carolina vividly reminds every American how sick the society is getting and how much we need to change things, says the serial adulterer who's a lying racist shitbag. Right. Six-year mistress. Yep. Yeah. Uh, New King was, quote, the only way you get change is to vote Republican. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Period. Full stop. Now, here's the, here's the part where I disagree. You can get a haircut off the street of Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is full of 20-year-old, 30-year-old, 40-year-old, 50-year-old interns, all of whom who would, you know, climb over their mother's body to get on TV for 10 minutes. Right. But they're you not former train. speakers of the House. Well, so they don't have that but here's, but here's the, But yeah. here's the point. There are a whole bunch of people on television who don't have any panache either. Yeah. Jeffrey Lord had nothing going for him but a shock of white hair and a willingness to just barf out any lie he wanted. Mm-hmm. And Jeff Zucker had no problem putting him on television. Yeah. Corey Lewandowski was a thug and a liar and a scumbag. And Jeffrey and and uh, Jeff Zucker put him on television. Mm-hmm. 
Rick Santorum is just a racist shitbag. I mean, there's a whole long list of people who are utterly unqualified to be anywhere near a, a camera having an opinion about anything. And at the top of that list, frankly, is Newt Gingrich. And here's the thing. Everyone knows it. Um, Rachel Maddow used to do extended um, essays on why does Newt Gingrich still have a yeah. job? He's yeah. he, he's selling crap out of the back of his van. He's, he's autographing shit. He's he's. <laughs> He's raffling off his good name to 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 whorehouses and and strip clubs. Why is he still in? And she even she could not get a straight answer from David Gregory, yeah. who every few months. I mean, it's two thousand nine, I think, eight or nine. New Gingrich was the most uh, frequent guest on the most prestigious television show, political show in America. Mm-hmm. And this was after he had absolutely disgraced himself. Oh, yeah. He'd been run out of town on a rail and everyone knew it. So, and he had, and again, had never held public office since then, never once. So you get to do that once or twice. But at some point it got to be, you can predict that no matter, that, that if Newt Gingrich goes off on a Monday and says, Democrats eat their babies, that, that uh, Barack Obama is a, is a colonial Kenyan, he just if he just butt scoots his racist ass all over the microphones by two weeks from then, he would be on Meet the Press. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the, the correlation between him saying and doing unforgivably despicable things and David Gregory welcoming him on the show and conspicuously refusing to ask him anything about it is why I, I set up the Gingrich rules. The Gingrich rules is New Gingrich will predictably do something awful. And the mainstream media will predictably put him right on the air right after that and never ask him about it to rehabilitate him as their go-to boy, as their go-to white-haired sage. And if they were being subtle about it, if there was just like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, um, that's fine. But everybody involved in this equation, everybody who watches, everybody who listens, everybody behind the camera, everybody in front of the camera, all know exactly what sort of a scumbag Newt Gingrich is. right. All of them know it. And and they could pick, they could have their pick of anybody else to put in front of the camera. They keep going back to him and they keep going back to him. And I don't understand why him. Now, maybe it is just, well, he's a former speaker. Great. There's a bunch of, Denny Hastert. He, all he ever did was molest people. You know, why not put him on television? Tom DeLay. Tom DeLay is an alcoholic who says crazy shit. Why not put him on there? The, and they're, the world is full of ex-politicians who will, who will hump your leg to get on camera. Why this asshole? Why this particular racist, sleazy douchebag who was, as Steve Kornacki just discovered a week mm-hmm. ago. In, in the entire chapter two of his book, Red versus Blue. Yeah. It is now in October, the year of our Lord, 2018, <laughs> conventional wisdom. Yeah. That 1994 uh-huh. gave us today's politics. You've only been saying this for 10 years. Uh, well, I've been saying it since 1994, well, yeah, frankly, but, uh, but I've been writing, writing about, about it. it right? Uh, yeah. Axios is saying it. New York Times is saying it. Uh, I'm looking, I'm just scrolling down, looking up Newt Gingrich 1994, okay? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> the, the daily yep. podcast from the New York Times, uh, Roll Call, uh, Douglas Herbert, who is a France 24 commentator on world affairs. Mike Barbaro, who's a uh, host of the Daily at the New York Times. Okay, that's a that's their little podcast thingy. Uh, so he, ev- everyone, including Steve Kornacki, including uh, you know everyone who and and I can't speak to to how uh, Ornstein and Mann are feeling at this moment <laughs> because they said it <laughs> after you did, but yes. in a way that should have got it on the Sunday shows. And explain why. Explain well, you go why. ahead and explain why. Go ahead. Uh, uh, Norm Ornstein and Thomas Mann, uh, who wrote this um, incredibly um, uh, just, I felt incredibly justified reading it. I like, yes, yes, right. Someone else sees. Someone else sees the monsters too. I, you know, someone else sees what I'm seeing. Um, it gave me the same feeling I got when I started reading blogs back in uh, 2004. Right. I thought. Uh, is anyone else noticing the country's losing its mind? Then I discovered Talking Points Memo, and that led to, to the news blog. And suddenly there's a tribe of people who, who all understand what I'm going through. And that felt great. And I really do hope, as a brief aside, that we provide something like that for our listeners. Mm-hmm. That you are not alone. You are not going through this alone. We're, we all see the boogeyman. We all see it out there. So this column went out. 
Uh, I forget the title of it, but it was very much the Republican Party is a is a reactionary outlier party. It is not a normal political party. This is not both sides are doing this. This is not an equal uh, uh, an equal balance of of blame between both sides. Maybe sometime in the future it will be, but as of right now, it is absolutely not true. Here's the academic research to back it up, etc. And Norm Ornstein was interviewed probably a couple of years ago, and I, I read it somewhere, and he said this was the most shared article. I think yeah, it, was it was the Washington, Washington Post. Post. I've just pulled it up. April 27, 2012. Oh, the op-ed uh-huh. is called, let's just say it, colon, the Republicans are yeah. the problem. Yes, that's it. It was the most, at the time, <clears throat> the most shared column mm-hmm. out there. It was the one that everyone in the Beltway was talking about. Uh, so by that, that's the standard for getting your ass right. on television. Did you say something buzzy and and uh, and controversial and startling? And quick, get that man on TV. He just said something that everyone's talking about. Let's interview him. What happened instead is their phones yeah. went dead. Nobody wanted they to talk to them. They were from the Sunday these are guys and, who, and that is a verifiable yeah. article in the nation, yeah. documented fact. They were not allowed to be on the Sunday shows. Right. Before that, they were boring, right. Brookings Institute, you know, one's a Democrat, one's a Republican, middle of the but road. But they were researchers. You know, uh, policy and, analysts. Yeah, right. Right, exactly. They were, but they were boring. They didn't, you know, they just said, well, you know, it's this and that. And they were policy guys. And they finally said, we have to, this is, there's no debate anymore. This is the truth. This is what's happening right in front of us. And they agreed between them to write this. And again, it was hugely popular and nobody called them. Believe me. Writing hugely popular truths about the Republican Party and having no one return your phone calls mm-hmm. is pretty much my life. So I do understand what they were going through in a very small right, way. Right. But they had already been to the mountaintop. They were uh, in what we call the Booker's Rolodex, right? They were available to be on TV and they were yeah, – exactly. their phone number was coded in as somebody you could call to have on to talk about policy. Absolutely. And right. they were suddenly dead men. Nobody would talk to them. Nobody, and, and they ended up like on Saturday morning, right. Chris Hayes show. Right. And, and Norm Ornstein was, had, the, as I recall, that look on his mm-hmm. face mm-hmm. that what the hell happened? You know, no, everyone stopped But everyone shared me. this article and talked about it amongst themselves. And it was a huge buzz right. off camera <laughs> because – and this is what I wanted to get to is so, people have known since before 2012 – that this was the case, that Newt oh, yeah. Gingrich was responsible for this kind of bomb throwing. And now it is just conventional wisdom yeah. that you can talk about it as a historical fact, but not talk about all of the enabling that you mm-hmm. just mentioned about Newt Gingrich. You don't talk about that, no. right? No. <clears throat> now that Steve Kornacki's written about it. I, I'll... Right. <laughs> That's like the level, right? <laughs> Look, I want to say God bless yeah. Steve Kornacki because I know that uh, that it takes a very special kind of wiring to be that yes. obsessed with yeah. poll numbers. It's it seems to me very damaging at yes. this point in the election cycle to be talking about polls yes. all the time and horse race all the time. Uh, there are people that have an appetite for that. No. I don't. Uh, but you know, I'm I'm not down on Steve Kornacki. I'm not mad at Steve Kornacki. Well, I'm I'm not down on it, but I will be honest. You and I had a conversation the other day about buying a voodoo doll of uh, Steve Kornacki <laughs> and hitting it and hitting it with the big board every time he opens his pie hole to talk about the Ohio third. Shh. Oh, there's a nice, that's a nice yeah. image. I'm just saying, <laughs> shut up with the polls already. Okay. I get it. That's the only language you speak. And if the, right. the only tool you have is that big board, then every problem looks like a statistical anomaly within the polling data. 10 years from junior dude. Yeah, he, I mean, oh, really, I, I junior, we, we, I gave birth yes, to did. To a Steve Kornacki. And I'm glad he's not wearing a ridiculous looking coat and trying to have a Saturday show. A game show? It was just (laughs) painful to watch. That was was bad. In in this case, this is MSNBC going, okay, we hired this guy. And he doesn't go, he doesn't fit anywhere. He's got got one really, really classically good skill. He twirls the baton like a son of a bitch. Uh, But I don't know if one hour of baton twirling every Saturday is going to hold that audience. Uh, then yeah. they figured out, well, you plug him in during election to talk about stats. That's great. He's a quant jock. That's great. Um, but my my the the nit I pick with Steve Kornacki is not uh, his talent. It's that we really, really need to stop talking about polls around the time that he wants to start talking about them. The, the, the point being that, 
oh, if Steve Kornacki says it, then now we can all talk about it. We all right, knew right, about it, right. but but only, only, once again, for the zillionth time, only the dirty hippies were talking about it. Only the dirty liberals who we don't put on the Sunday show every month or every week, who we don't acknowledge exist, who we brush off as fringe lunatics, who we dismiss and laugh at and mocks, mostly David Brooks used to call us that, um, who were saying this all along. Um, and and mm-hmm. just, just so we're clear... Um, I'm going to read very briefly from The Politics of Slash and Burn, which is an article, uh, sick, traitor, bizarre, self-serving, shallow, corrupt, pathetic, shame. Uh, the group that urged political candidates to use these epithets um, has since regretted using the word traitor in response, but the other words are just fine. The group is called GOPAC. It's the mm-hmm. GOP Political Action Committee. This is an article from the New York Times in September of 1990. 1990. The New York Times briefly mentioned that, hey – the, the Republican Party under this guy named Newt Gingrich is descending into this Orwellian shithole. But we're pretty sure, and this is the end of the article, the nakedness of the GOPAC offering itself also makes it useful. There must be limits to the negative politics that voters will bear. The bald appeal to invective will certainly probe those limits. Um, it didn't. It didn't. <laughs> it didn't. No. Because the New York Times, like every other person in the Beltway, every other respectable institution, was waiting around for someone else to show up to stop Newt Gingrich. And right. nobody ever did. Right. And the only people who, who were willing to step up and say, this is really bad. And what's happening in, on, a, in, on, a, on a parallel track on right-wing hate radio is equally bad, and it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. And what's happening in Fox News is equally bad and also a symbiotic relationship. And all these three things together are starting to normalize this behavior. This is becoming the vocabulary of Republicans. And now those hateful, awful, shitty people showing up on Meet the Press. And and it's creeping into the groundwater. It's becoming just how Republicans are, as opposed to something that's horrible and shocking and needs to be dealt with immediately. And this is why we wanted to spend so much of our show talking about Newt Gingrich. Exactly. Because this week has been a complete backing up from the edge of Newt Gingrich politics and saying, well, you know, both sides and the rhetoric is just terrible. Oh, the rhetoric. And we really, we really have to, to both sides, both sides, both sides, and both sides. And you, and it has been a both siders week because a Republican who supports the president and has been to Trump's rallies mm-hmm. and has mega stickers and stickers tart with, with crosshairs mm-hmm. over Hillary Clinton's face mm-hmm. and Van Jones chest and CNN logo, you know, and, and other people other, and has sent, bombs has sent bombs to two former presidents Mm -hmm. and several democratic leaders and members of the media this shit got real this week it did and when shit gets real you don't go you know what since 1994 we've been dabbling in this shit and now we're paying the price Mm -hmm. you don't say that you say both sides look mitch mcconnell wasn't allowed to eat his soup yeah it's so sad mitch mcconnell was not allowed to to eat his soup in peace. And we think that's just a terrible, terrible thing that we should all have to pay for now. Yeah, you know what? And 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 that's the flip side of this that I think cannot be missed in all in this whole argument, which is Republican members of Congress have completely cut themselves off from their constituents. Even John Stewart was not able to John get Stewart. and Remember John him? Stewart, you know, TV star John Stewart was not able to get an audience with certain right. congressmen because he's not a billionaire donor. They've they've canceled their town halls. Mm-hmm. To a person, Republican congressmen have not held town halls in 18 months since the health care vote. And so if your constituents have not been heard, and this is still a democracy, constituents need to find a way to be heard. If you're not going to meet with them, if you're not going to hold a meeting to meet with them, if everything that you do is going to be scripted and protected and you're only going to meet mm-hmm. with your friends in Fox News and that's it. And in the meantime, we have this racist bullshit bombing level of politics going on on the right uh, where, you know, the candidate for the governor of Florida is getting lots and lots of help from racists. Oh, yeah. It will pretty much, you know, 100 percent. Right. And Andrew Gillum in the debate, to his credit, said, yeah. I am not calling my mm-hmm. opponent a racist. I am saying that racists think he's a racist, think he's an ally. Yeah. And that there's that's provable. 
Then you have the, the Republican gubernatorial candidate Kemp in Georgia routinely destroying votes. And over and over in Texas now that today, uh, voter suppression in Texas on college campuses is rampant. They're limiting the number of early voting days on campuses. Uh, there's a lawsuit going forward. Uh, and it is simply time to strengthen the Voting Rights Act mm-hmm. and start putting some of these bastards in jail for preventing black people and young people from voting. This is a Republican strategy for how to win elections. And it should be illegal Mm -hmm. and it should be punishable, not by fines, not by, oh, no, don't do that after the election's over. But, you know, everyone who participated in the Brooks Brothers riot in Florida should be in prison right now. They stopped people in Broward County from having their votes that they'd already voted from being counted. That's what they did to win, to win that presidency. They should be in prison. Well, and and here's the thing. Um, Since long before... I began blogging. Um, Any of my Republican colleagues or friends or people I debated with when I back when I had a full time job, lived in Chicago, I would give them free advice about how to save their party. Yeah, right. I I used to to write about this to David Brooks all the time. He stopped uh, corresponding (laughs) with me for some reason. I don't know why. You never corresponded with David Brooks. No, no, never, never once. He, 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 I know for a fact he knows I exist and knows. Oh, sure. Right about him. And, and, it, and um, it hurts him deeply. <laughs> it does. But it doesn't affect him at all because he lives yeah. inside Prince Prospero's bubble right. where nothing will reach him. The play, the Red Death will never reach him. So nothing he writes matters. He doesn't live in my country. He doesn't speak my language. He just happens to be ruining my country. But since long before this, I have been offering free of charge um, with, a, with a good heart. I mean, with a little sarcasm, with a good heart, how to save the Republican Party. Um, and it's very simple. You kick the bigots out. Yep. You yep. show them the fucking yep. door. You tell them to go away. The problem is, and every Republican knows it. You would lose every election be- from now until the end of time. You'd be you would be the California Republican Party. Exactly. I'm not saying California Republicans don't have no. bigots in them. I'm just saying you would you'd be, be a permanent minority party. You'd be yep. you'd be the Chicago Republican Party. Yeah. You know, yeah. you'd have one alderman maybe every now and then. You would never ever win another election ever. And every Republican policymaker, every ad man, every speech writer, every politician goddamn well knows it because George H.W. Bush did not reach for Edmund Burke to win office. He reached for Lee Atwater. And George W. Bush, when he wanted to win, did not reach for Edmund Burke or Mike Oakenshot. He didn't reach for policy philosophy from the 19th century. He went straight to his good friend Karl Rove and said, how do we win this? And Rove says, oh, beat up the gays. Yeah, That's how you do it. Yeah. You beat up the gays. And he put up, they know their base. They know this is true. Absolutely and always have. And that's why um, I wrote a little post today. I'm not going to go into it too much. But a decade ago, um, the Republicans like Andrew Sullivan – and Kathleen Parker and David Brooks and George Will. I mean, by a, a decade ago, literally a 10 years ago today, I wrote this. Um, we're all just up in arms about how the Republican Party was fucked up and how awful it was and how terrible it was. And they came up with a new term for defining who would be part of their new coalition. Mm-hmm. And that new, new term was called real conservatives. That was a decade ago. A yeah. decade ago, I was laughing my ass off going, I can't believe you never noticed your party is full of Republicans. Right, right. A decade later, there's now an entire new fiction genre called Never Trumping. Yes. In which many of these same people are now writing books saying, oh, my God, the Republican Party is full of Republicans. They've known all along what the real GOP looks like. That's why Newt Gingrich gets to go on television every month, whether or not he deserves it. That's why they keep bringing lunatics on the air. That's why David Brooks has a job. David Brooks' job has always been to tell people like me that I'm imagining it. Yeah. Tell his yeah. colleagues in, inside the Beltway bubble, don't worry about it. That's what uh, Joe Scarborough's job was. Don't worry about those crazy people. They're just the fringe. Yeah. They're not any danger at all. They're just the nuts. And you know what? They're nuts on both sides, Blue Gal. And I remember I remember distinctly David Brooks on the news hour saying, I don't know what Rush Limbaugh says. Yeah. I don't know what he, you know, Rush Limbaugh, I don't know what Rush Limbaugh says. David Brooks does not live in America. David Brooks lives on the Acela Corridor and talks only to people who speak his language. And because... Because he was so valuable at lying to the rest of the country about who the real Republicans were, about what they really behaved, about how they really hated this country, about what real bigots they were, he was invaluable. 
because he would go from college campus to college campus to podium to TED Talk to church and tell large audiences of really privileged white people that there was nothing to worry about because Rush Limbaugh was some freakish anomaly that, that spoke only to a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of people out there. And that was the party line. And I mean, literally the party line of Republicans for decades. And now we all know it was all a lot. And we all know that everyone who put Newt Gingrich on television, who put David Brooks on television, who promoted themselves as speakers for the Republican Party, they all knew about it and they all lied the entire time. What's the result? The result was Donald yep. Trump. Yep. And that and that's where I want to take this podcast, which is that all of a sudden, and you wrote a whole post about this, about Jeff Zucker. I did. But it really boils down to the whole beltway. I did. All of a sudden, shit got real. All of a sudden, uh-huh. the attacks that Donald Trump is doing about fake news, uh, which, which to their credit, a lot mm-hmm. of people at CNN and other news organizations did call them on that and say, but it was very weak tea. It was, you know, really, that's a dangerous precedent to be making, and maybe you shouldn't be saying that. Sure. And maybe we should call them out for this because this is very dangerous. Well, members of Congress who are their good buddies and source material, and you can always call them for a roll out of your Rolodex for a quote off the record, right, uh-huh. uh, are doing nothing to stop this. No. Because tax cuts for billionaires. Because they know who their base are. They know who they are. And they live with it. It's all, a, it's a club. Mm-hmm. And so uh, the violence is now in the club. Right. And all of a sudden, like I said, shit got real. And now you're having both siders. Yeah. Now, again, to their credit, the hosts of these MSNBC shows are having people like Matt Schlapp on the air, which why? Mm -hmm. Uh, is to fill the space between commercials. That's right. But when Matt Schlapp starts his both siderist bullshit, they are calling it out. Finally, because the bombs are in your building. Your buildings are being evacuated. Manhattan is being evacuated. It's affecting you directly. Before this, you were never going to miss a meal or lose health care or worry about your kid going in a cage because you're in the beltway and you're well-paid and well-fed and and privileged. And you don't recognize your own privilege. And now... Now the bombs yeah, in now your building. Now the red death is inside the castle. The red death is uh-huh. inside and the now, castle. Yeah, and that's the thing about the 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 the, the, the because liberals' superpower is memory. The mm-hmm. the media's superpower is forgetfulness. They yeah. really would yeah. like you to forget yeah. the the fact that they built this monster. They enabled it. They let it slide. Yeah. They're the ones. Yeah. It wasn't me. I'm a nobody. I'm just a podcaster in the middle of a cornfield. It was Jeff Zucker who put the worst people in America on television. Because of ratings, it, Jeff yep. Zucker invented Donald Trump. Well, and still has still has Corey Lewandowski on his show from time to time. You know, it'd be nice if you have him on to talk about violence against women. Yeah, why don't you have him on to talk about your his experience with grabbing a woman reporter by the arm and hurting her? Mm-hmm. And that's why you and I watch this when we do it as a puppet show. I mean, no yes, right. right, no sane organization would put a Katrina Pearson or a Kaylee McEnany, or a Paris fucking Denard, you know, talking lawn furniture, Paris Denard on television, uh, Jeffrey Lord on television, just spew bullshit. Obvious, right. just, right. and they're laughing while they're doing it. Like, I, I, and I understand why. I, Jeffrey Lord had got to be thinking, I can't believe I get paid for this. I'm yeah, literally just yeah. pulling shit out of my ass, slapping on the desktop and calling it Belgian chocolate. And my boss yeah. pays me for this. I can't believe it. But that is Jeff Zucker's business model, putting yes, it is. reasonable sane Democrats and lunatics in a cage and having them fight and pretending that that is a panel discussion about public policy. But it's yeah. not. It's a freak show. And freak shows do what? They gather audiences. People will stop and rubberneck at this at this at this accident. And then Jeff mm-hmm. Zucker can do what he really wants to do, which is sell them dick pills and reverse mortgages. Right, he doesn't give right. a shit about this country. Jeff Zucker does not give a one good goddamn about this country uh, up to the point where it affects his rating. Or, or affects his business model where it, it actually costs him money to have his building evacuated. And then he writes right. an angry letter talking about there's a complete – the total and complete lack of understanding of, from the White House. Words have consequences. Words matter. Right. right. Really. Really, you're, right. just... you're the you're one of the guys. You're one of several yeah. guys, white guys yes. who had an empty Trump podium 
every single time that orange monster spoke in the summer of 2016, you stopped coverage. You would not cover a Hillary Clinton speech or a Bernie Sanders speech because you were airing empty Trump podiums waiting for him to come out and put on a show. Rating. How many of your employees got up and left the press room once it became clear that they were just going to be lied to by smirking racist assholes every fucking day? Not one of them. Not one of them. How many people have, how many, how many CNN employees, how many, I'm sorry, how many, how many reporters in the middle of a Trump press conference have asked the question, Mm -hmm. why do you lie so fucking much? Every word out of your mouth for the last 20 minutes has been a fucking lie. What, do you just not realize it? Are you a sociopath? Do you realize that you're doing, and just broach the subject of lying with the person who was lying in your face every day for the last two years in the White House Mm -hmm. and every day for the last three years. On the campaign trail. Why is that so hard? Well, it's because I'll go back to my cubicle and there'll be a little note there from my boss saying, there's a sheet cake waiting for you in the break room and right. good luck right. in your next assignment. Meanwhile, Megan Kelly can just roll in her own shit for a couple of years and money will rain down on her. Another instance of proof that shit got real is that yeah. in the White House this week, the comms team and Mike Pence actually stood out in front of the announcements about these bombs. And yeah. Donald Trump retweeted yeah. Mike Pence and said, I agree, and goes goes to his rally. He still went to a rally and said, I'm going to be nice. I'm going to be nice. Uh, if you mm-hmm. get a chance, go and watch from Thursday night, Seth Meyers, excuse me, Seth Meyers oh, yeah. Yeah. did his uh, A Closer Look, and he looked at Donald Trump saying, "I'm so look, I'm going to be nice. Look at me being nice. As if somehow being nice is not his, admitting to the world that being nice is not his normal way of acting, right? And being sane mm-hmm. is not his normal way of acting. See, I can do it. I can I do can, it. I, 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 I get smart. ice cream I'm now, smart. right? Yeah. I'm, I'm not stupid like people See? say. I was stepped over. <laughs> I was stepped over. And you're sitting you're literally the most powerful man on earth and you're bitching He's because bitching. you're Twitter He's followers. He's bitching at five in the you morning. Know, I'm such a victim. I'm yeah. such a victim. And let's be let's get back to that comm shop that set this yes, up. Yes, right. Let's let's not forget that the head of the comm shop at the White House was fired from Fox News in a scandal. His name was Bill Shine, and he was the executive and producer on Fox News who got shoved out with the rest of the sexual predatory garbage. Right. And and rather than go away forever, which is the appropriate, the least thing that should happen to him is just go and enjoy your retirement. He just was brought right back and put in charge of the White House communication yep. team. And and everyone looked with alarm. But CNN certainly isn't asking any questions of Bill Shine. And nobody else is because, well, again, this is the culture. If you ask, if you're, you will find a little Nor- Ornstein and Mann card on your desk <laughs> if you come back with it's got the saint written on it, right? Yeah, a little saint, a little saint drawn on there. Do, 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 do. Oh shit! I guess my yeah. career is over. Yeah. Unless, and then what you have to do is become a liberal blogger. Wait ten years, then Steve Kornacki will write a book about it and put an entire chapter two of your blog post in there about New Gingrich. <laughs> Did you realize Bill Shine was in charge of the White House? And then you'll you'll be redeemed. You'll be unemployed, but you'll be redeemed. But. I'm telling all of you employees of CNN and MSNBC out there, don't make the mistake we made. (laughs) Don't be right too soon. Don't try to go up against the machine. Of course, I'm lying. You should always be right and you should always tell your truth and you should stand on whatever soapbox you have with whatever voice you have and let people know the truth as you see Mm -hmm. it. That is your right as a goddamn American. And if it makes Mitch McConnell miss his soup course, well, that's just too fucking bad for Mitch McConnell. You and I do not trust uh, never Trumpers. <laughs> no, no, that's for sure. A couple of but, them are, are not well, bad. And and of course, David Jolly left the Republican Party. Right? Yes, he did. But to yes. his credit, to his uh-huh. credit, David Jolly uh, made a statement this week on Twitter that, uh, and it was about interrupting people's lunch and interrupting people's dinners. And yep. he w- he supports people who do that. Yeah, because he said these people are not anointed to be in the offices that they hold. They are accountable to their constituents. And if they don't like being accountable to their constituents, if they want to cut off communication with their constituents, they don't deserve that job. It is a Mm -hmm. job. It is not a life uh, appointment 
to of royalty where you should never bother the king, no. right? This is and a Dave Jolly has that. I fell in with so, the, with the wrong crowd, ma. That's where it wasn't me, ma. <laughs> and you know what? He was one term, and it was like, holy shit, what did I get myself into? I'm willing to buy that from people like yeah, that. Yeah. Oh, and but, he said you know, that. Here's here's the tweet. I found the tweet. I'm just yeah. going to say it. I don't think there's anything wrong with confronting election elected officials in public. Mm-hmm. Nothing. Zero. We should do more of it. It is who we are as Americans. Channel Thoreau. Do it. No politician was conscripted to serve. They asked for the opportunity. Yeah. Right. Damn so, right. Good for I him. Did. Good for him. And, here, yeah. and you know who's doing that right now, just to sort of ease us back into that? Um, we are having debates now, mm-hmm. uh, congressional debates. One of our candidates for, uh, for, for office has been running the hell away from any public encounter with any constituent. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's, our, that's the Roddy Davis. That's the incumbent. And Betsy Jerkson Lodergren has been holding town halls and talking to anybody who will listen to her and really being a model good um, candidate. What is cool watching the debates and watching um, Democrats across the country is watching Democratic campaigns learning from each other. Yes. So yes. every Republican has been trying to run against Nancy Pelosi. <laughs> And, to the point and of, just, mention, and, of Dave Bratt mentioning her 21 times in one debate. Yeah, just, and this was and, the start and, of, like you say, a meme where Democrats learn from each other. Abigail did. Spanberger said to Dave Bratt, her opponent, my name is Abigail Spanberger. I'm not Nancy Pelosi. I am asking for your vote. And, I, and she's a former CIA agent. I mean, come right. on. She has right. obviously uh, been catered to by the Democratic Party to please run for the seat, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, she's right out of central casting as the perfect person to run against this asshole mm-hmm. Dave Brad, who is really one of the biggest dicks in Congress, in my personal opinion. Uh, mm-hmm. But as you say, then other people have picked up on this. My name is including right, including our Congress yes, uh, next Congresswoman. Right. <laughs> That's right. I think Stacey yeah. Abrams did as well. Um, and and uh, they're doing the full Walter White Heisenberg. Mm-hmm. Say my name. Say my name. <laughs> You're Betsy Jerkson. You're goddamn right. <laughs> and and it really is. It's it's aggressive and confident without being bullying or asshole. Right. It's, it's saying fuck you. I'm me. Here are my credentials. I am running for this office. I am way better qualified than you. Stacey Abrams has gone so far as to say, and and this is smart. My opponent is so afraid of me yeah. that he has to steal votes to try to beat me. Right. Because he knows he can't beat me on the issues because I'm, I'm kicking his ass every which way. So this gutless little weasel has to steal votes. She doesn't say that because she's a nicer person than me. But watching candidates learn from each other. And this is not from the top down. This seems to be really organic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, that they're, they're just observing what works and picking up on each other. Um, and, and I find that incredibly um, encouraging that they're, they're agile. Yes. They're right. quick on their feet. And that is, that is really cool. We should mention that uh, – it appears as though there are text messages showing that Roger Stone tried to get a yes. presidential pardon for Julian Assange. Yes, uh, yes. And, um, and I want to talk for a minute about uh, just a little personal matter. We had a birthday party this past week uh, for Junior Dude, who turned 20, and we want to wish him a very happy birthday, uh, getting closer and closer to adulthood, uh, official adulthood. And uh, But my ex-husband has a real talent for... Um, <laughs> inappropriate gifts for children. I mean, he just doesn't get what kids would like. He's much older than I am and he just doesn't get it. What kids might want for his, for their birthdays or Christmas. Or Every whatever. kid wants a shoe stretcher. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Like, you know, I got you, I got you some collar stays. Okay. Right? I mean, what? <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah. he, uh, brought to the birthday party for a 20 year old, uh, college sophomore, a copy of Ben Sass's book. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Into Drift Glass's house, he, he brought, brought a copy this. of Ben Sass's book. In I my want you to house understand. Where I play with my children. <laughs> well, his children, technically, but. His you know. children. <laughs> and we try to stay very cordial for the sake of the children. We really have. Sure. I think I think I, patting myself on the back, have done a remarkable you have. job. I just keep keeping slipping gin into your glass and you just. You just keep <laughs> no, you don't. Right along. No, no, no. 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 It's, it's all very cordial and grown up, and you'd all be proud of us. Yeah. I, and then I looked down at the gift because he didn't wrap it. He just brought it and said, here, here's your, here's your gift. 
And I look down and he's whole, it's in front of him. Like he's proud that he just got this book and they had to go back in the back of the bookstore to get it. Cause it's just out. It's so you know? hot. It's so hot. It's so it's hot. All kids getting it. And, and I look down and I look up at you and I look down and again, I look up at you and you finally notice and you're just like, Oh, and I would, and we could have <laughs> let that go. <laughs> We could have let that well, go. Well, I think we're going to let everything else. I don't think we should talk about the rest of the evening. No, 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 no. But it was a lively <laughs> evening full it was, of interesting it was conversation. a lively evening. <laughs> yes. yes. I, I think uh, somehow someone's fourth wife has been turning on uh-huh. Fox News. That's what you know, I think. Has been Will happening. Ferrell. So, uh, that escalated really fast. It, escalates, it escalated really fast be- <laughs> yeah. in, in, in because a certain person at the table decided to tell us that Donald Trump was being treated unfairly by the media. So yeah. leave, it that, that's all you leave it at that. Leave and it at that. Leave it at that. And speaking of Donald Trump being treated unfairly <laughs> by the media, let's just, I, I don't want, because we do have a huge news run now. We don't have a lot of time. So let me right. just do the caravan. Okay, let's do the, the caravan. That's an like, important story. Is, and that, it makes me really mad. It's not a yeah. caravan. It's, it's, a, it's a bunch of tired people walking up refugees. from South America. Yes. Refugees. These are refugees on foot, slowly walking up. They're still hundreds, perhaps a thousand miles away. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but since the everything the Republicans have done in the last two years has been a monumental failure. Um, they're running on two issues. One is lying constantly about health care. Right. Not just lying like in a 45 degree angle of the tooth or a 30 degree angle, 180 degrees from the truth. Absolute they're gaslighting. The ones, Absolute gaslighting. Yeah, they're the ones who want to save pre, uh, uh, pre-existing, uh, conditions, covered, from yeah. pre-existing conditions. Yeah. Democrats are the ones who want you all to die uh, in a pit with hogs. And, and, and it's just like p- Democrats have figured out that Republicans just lie all the time. Right. I don't think the ones on TV have figured that out. I don't think the networks have figured it. They're still like flummox. Chris Hayes is still, oh my God, can you believe he said that? But Democratic candidates figured out, just call them a liar. Yeah. Just say they're lying. Yeah. They're, you're lying. I, here's, you voted against it 11 times. You're, you have a lawsuit that says you want to take people's protections against pre existing conditions away. You're lying. You're lying to these people. You're sitting yeah. here lying right now. And they don't know how to deal with that because they're used to dealing with Chuck Todd. Right. Who will never call him a liar. They're used to dealing with the soft hands of the media, never calling them out, never challenging them. The same people that put Newt Gingrich on the air for 20 goddamn years, that's who they're used to talking to. They're not used to talking to people who say bullshit to their face. Mm -hmm. So they're running on that, which is failing miserably. And they're running on this caravan of literally trillions of armed uh, jihadis, I guess. Right. And and there's a few ISIS people slipped in there. In there. Uh, who are who are literally inches away from the U.S. border on Monday? Who who right. weren't there on Wednesday? Apparently, after Mike Pence actually doubled down and supported Donald Trump over that, right? Well, Donald Trump insisted there were Middle Easterners. They're in the tiny, slow-moving group of refugees that are hundreds of miles from the border who are trying to walk to this country to save their lives. Mike Pence, being Mike Pence, leaped out there and said, it's inconceivable because he's never seen The Princess Bride, ever. <laughs> he's never watched any movie other than, I think, the uh, I think the uh, Left Behind series. He might have seen that. Yeah. That's about it. Uh, it's inconceivable that there are not people of Middle Eastern descent there in the sense that we're all descended from Lucy in Africa <laughs> four million years ago. I guess that's theoretically true. But in every other context, Mike Pence is just a lying douchebag. Um, and then, of course, Donald Trump, having gotten all of his people way out on the limb, just saws it right out behind him. The next day, Donald Trump, someone asked, actually challenged him on it. Where's your proof? He says, well, there's no proof, but it, it could be. And that's it. And, yeah. and you can hear the, the, the branch under Mike Pence cracking and falling to the ground, except that never happens. Nobody, there are never any consequences when they get caught lying because I have nuclear weapons. But to, to prepare for this slow-moving, walking group of tired humans, a small group who are slowly approaching the U.S. butter hundreds of miles away, Donald Trump is going to dispatch 800 active duty troops. And this is all they have to run on, scaring their meathead base that scary brown people are coming for them. Scary brown people. And if I may, the one white male billionaire who is being slandered is George Soros. He's George Soros. And I'm I'm not, you know, he's got a great life and I'm not scared mm-hmm. for him. I I mean, he received a bomb delivered to his office and his, and his home uh, in a direct result of all of the slander 
that Fox News is throwing his way. And always has. Um, and always has. And has for years. Back in the Bill O'Reilly days, George Soros was the bo- was the Jewish boogeyman. And the slander has, uh, the sad part is for me, is that the slander has a factual basis in that George Soros is raising money to help refugees in their home countries get back to back home, have money, have something to live on. Uh, he is working with uh, the United Nations High Commission on Refugees to raise half a billion dollars to help re- to actually help refugees. So that turns into George Soros is funding an invasion against American sovereignty by helping brown people mm-hmm. mo- rush, you know, the distance from Miami to New York on foot <laughs> in across the border. Right. Rushing uh, to whatever swing state it's is they're needed to vote illegally and overturn the midterms. And then go state to state, apparently, yeah. using some sort of rapid transit system. Maybe <sighs> Joe Biden knows which Amtrak lines they'll be using to go literally from state to state to flip the elections for everyone. Because every Republican who's going to lose is because right. illegal immigrants infiltrated our system and flipped the vote. Before November 6th. And that's the story they're going to they tell. 3,000 uh, miles away by foot. And they're also apparently going to make it to the yeah. lake houses of Wisconsin, according to one re- MAGA voter, and and spend the winter at these vacant homes, vacation homes of the rich and famous of Wisconsin and Minnesota. And, you know, they're in the lakes. The, there's nobody there in the wintertime, so they could just move in. We can't even protect our lake homes. We can't even protect <laughs> our lake homes for these people. We can't even do that. Since you mentioned Bill O'Reilly, one brief aside. Remember, Bill O'Reilly was fired from Fox News for being a pervert, right? An expensive pervert. An expensive $32 million pervert, which you could use to buy our local newspaper nine times over. But remember, Bill O'Reilly was not fired from Fox News from going on every night and saying, Tiller the baby killer, Tiller the baby killer, call him Dr. Tiller a murderer and inciting someone to actually kill him. That was a direct, you can draw a direct line between a political assassination and Bill O'Reilly. But that was not. That was not enough to get him fired because inciting fired violence among the wing nuts is the Fox News yep. business model. The, these people are their core demographic. They're not. They're not. The, the the thing that really just creeps me out is you look at this guy's social media, yeah. not Bill O'Reilly's, but yeah. the bomber whose name shall go unmentioned. His social media is absolutely indistinguishable from the from the all caps emails I've been getting from Republicans for years. Absolutely. It is as if Crazy Uncle Liberty took a barf on a yeah. van. It absolutely is. Yeah. These are Facebook memes of your crazy Uncle Liberty. You want to talk about one more Florida man? Florida man who was arrested for groping a woman on a on a flight defended himself by claiming that Trump said, quote, it's okay to grab women by their private parts. Trump said it was okay. He sure as hell did. And Lion Ted is not Lion Ted anymore. He's beautiful, groveling, ass kicking footstool Ted. So Well, and and I hate to I hate to say this, Drip Glass, but you know, Ben Sasse in his yeah. book <laughs> you, you didn't hate to say that. Talks about loneliness, Drift Glass. So lonely. You know, uh you wanted to end on that. But it is true. It is true that lonely people do gravitate towards uh cults yeah. and do gravitate towards if we all believe the same thing, right or wrong, then I'm not alone right. because I have my MAGA crew with me and we are all devoted to this ideology. That means I'm not wrong and I'm not alone because I have all these people around me. And in large part, that's what the Russians yes. did is on Twitter, they made it look like you had 40 people immediately agree with your crackpot theories. You know, that's a drug. Right. Mm-hmm. That's that is that goes right into your brain. I have all these people liking what I say. Um, and in repentance news, uh, we should mention that Jeff Flake finally said, I don't believe Brett Kavanaugh, but I voted for him anyway. And even Ron uh, Fournier told him to shut up and go away. Even Ron, Ron Fournier, Fournier. Think about that. Hey, guys, each week we post to our Facebook page and website and Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. But this week's Internet Kitties are goats. Yeah. <laughs> Francesca and Fernando were sent in by our science fiction university pal, Dogface Herman. They are from uh, a farm in his area. You know, he owns a sheep farm. He owns a farm with sheep and horses. Uh, but Francesca and Fernando uh, are from a nearby farm and uh, are used by permission. Francesca likes to put her head through the fence 
and then wait for someone to come and pull her out. <laughs> I, uh, Doc Face Charmin writes and says, I was told that the day before I took this photo, she did this four times. <laughs> She's not in distress. She's just a goat. I think she probably likes the attention, right? Yeah. Oh, look at me. Oh, I'm trying. Uh oh, I'm stuck in the fence oh. again. Uh oh. <laughs> anyway, these are beautiful goats, and you should go visit them, Francesca and Fernando, at our Facebook page and website. Uh, Drift Glass, you knocked on doors this week. I did, and I this weekend. Reaching my goal of 100 postcards to voters yep. before the election, I'm at 80 right now. So we're getting there. We're working hard. I hope you're working hard, too, and, and that you will take the time to encourage your friends and family to vote, uh, drive them to the polls, grab friends mm -hmm. and drive them to the polls, get them to the polls, vote early, get, get that ballot in and vote. Very, very important. You can send your internet kitty to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, or you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions. Letter on the air, unless you say otherwise. We received a letter this week from a new listener who discovered us and is a Postal yeah. Union member and thanked us for our support of Postal Unions. And we do support post. We support unions in general, but we support our Postal Unions. And uh, we appreciate you being a new listener and new contributor to our podcast. Thank you. Don't forget our Gourmet Coffee Guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. And, and really, five bucks makes a difference. If you have never donated before, uh, five bucks a month. Makes a difference. We really appreciate it. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution. You can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on Facebook or Twitter. And thank you for doing that. Hey, Blue Gal. How are the Internet Kitties doing this week? Well, the Internet Kitties wish everyone a fun and safe Halloween and a very happy birthday next week to Drift Glass. Oh. Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying and the shooting and the dying and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. Professional Left Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2018, DGBG Productions Incorporated.